Okay, welcome to our next lecture. Uh, this one is going to be an exciting one, I think. There's more uh, video, uh, some different accents, and um, a variety of different things. So let's get started. Chapter 8, Lecture 6, Joints, Part B. The classification of synovial joints. There are six types based on shape of articular surfaces. The plane, the hinge, the pivot, the condyloid, the saddle, the bowl and socket. We're going to take a look at each one of these. The plane joints, I just couldn't resist this plane. Online it was actually an animated gif, so it kind of waggles in space as if its rudder had been torn off or something, or uh, had a bit of a problem with that. So I'm going to see here, pointer options, pen. So here then, one of the things that we take a look at is that if you don't have a rudder on your plane, then you're going to have some problems and your plane is going to waggle this way and that way. So that's what that animation showed. All right. Plane joints are non-axial joints. They have flat articular surfaces and they do short gliding movements. So we take a look at those, a plane joint here, an intercarpal joint. So this sliding movement that we see. Hinge joints, and now I'll end the English accent. That was that little bit of the, the presentation. All right, hinge joints then are uniaxial joints. They have motion along a single plane and they have flexion and extension only. The hinge joint then, uh, we take a look at that. A classic one that we reference would be, you know, we have this um, trochlear notch and that's going to jive with the trochlea. And so that joint right there is a hinge joint and that's what we're, we're interested in there. Pivot joints then, our rounded end of one bone is going to conform to a sleeve or a ring of another bone. And these have uniaxial movement only. We're interested in the elbow joint. We're going to see two joints uh, that comprise that, actually three joints. And the one that we're interested in is the relationship between the radia and the ulna. This relationship here, trochlear notch and trochlea, is with the ulna, it's a hinge joint. And then our pivot joint with the radius, that relationship between the radius and the ulna, the radio ulnar joint, is the joint that we take a look at as the pivot joint. Within that, then, I think that this illustration is pretty good. It shows the, the radial head of the radius interacting with the radial notch of the ulna. That relationship right there, in, in conjunction with the capitulum, is the the pivot joint that we're interested in. Condyloid or ellipsoidal joints are these joints that um, are biaxial joints. They're both articular surfaces are oval and they permit all angular movements. So just another example there, we see this, you know, metacarpal two coming up and interacting with this proximal phalange. That joint right there is the condyloid joint. Saddle joints then are biaxial and uh, meaning that we're, we move in a two-axis system. They allow greater freedom of movement than condyloid joints, and each articular surface has both concave and convex areas. So here, classic saddle joint, um, you know, if we're just mo making our movement from the, uh, the carpals in this, this area here into this metacarpal, and so that joint right in there is a saddle joint. So when you think about the movement of your thumb, of the pollux, this, the joint that it forms with the carpals is going to be a saddle joint. Ball and socket joints are multi-axial joints. So multi-axial is the key here. We're interested in these joints that have multiple axial axes. They're the most freely moving synovial joints, and for that matter, they're usually the most injured. So here we can see the classic uh, shoulder joint, and we have this fossa here that is going to go ahead and receive the head of the humerus here and this then is referred to as the glenohumeral joint because uh, this is the the glenoid fossa 
or the glenoid cavity here, right in there. So um, this, when we when we take a look at at the glenoid fossa, you see that it has uh, a pretty open uh, concave shape to receive the convex head of the humerus here. The knee joint is our largest, most complex joint of the body, and there it's actually three joints surrounded by a single joint cavity. There's the femoropatellar joint. So we have the, the femur sliding over the top, or the, sorry, the patella sliding over the top of the femur. And so that is a joint, it's a plane joint. And because we have this gliding motion, then we have lateral and medial tibiofemoral joints. So tibio, tibia with the femur. Uh, between the femoral condyles and the C-shaped lateral and medial menisci or semilunar cartilages of the tibia. So this relationship between the tibia and the femur is um, what we're interested in for the lateral and medial joints, the other two joints of the knee, to allow flexion, extension, and some rotation when the knee is partly flexed. So in here then, uh, when we take a look at this, we've got the quads and our semi-tendinosus, semi-membranosus, uh, our various muscles in here, biceps femoris, so uh, what you'd refer to as the hamstrings, that help to pull on the tibia to give us that flexion in this joint. Then our quadriceps muscles in the anterior compartment would go ahead and be antagonists to those muscles and give us the extension of the tibia or of the leg as we take a look at that. So the actions over this joint, really three joints, there's this femoropatellar, and then we have the uh, tibiofemoral. So um, three different joints, technically looking at the relationship between the patella and the femur, and then our lateral and medial meniscus with the lateral and medial condyles of the femur. As we take a look at dissecting the knee out a little bit more, we see this sagittal section where we have the femur, the tibia. Remembering that um, the relationship that we have with our anterior and posterior cruciate is going to be a relationship where we see that the reason why we call the anterior cruciate ligament the anterior cruciate ligament is that it's connecting more anteriorly on the tibia than this posterior cruciate ligament that's going behind and connecting in a more posterior position on the tibia. So posterior and anterior cruciate ligaments, you see how they make a cross, a crucia. And so this cross and then anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments is the formation we see in there. Now the femur then has um, this hyaline cartilage that's on its cap, on its epiphysis, and then the tibia has a hyaline cartilage cap as well. We also see that we have uh, lateral meniscus uh, coming into play. And notice how uh, this is cut away in the section, but this lateral meniscus is going to swing around and give us this connection posteriorly. So we usually see this cut and so when we take a look at a superior type of uh, transverse projection, we'll see that cut, but we need to remember that it goes all the way around the knee. We also see these synovial cavities in here and just how critical they are to cushioning tendons, cushioning bone on bone type of action. So here's that superior transverse section or view and you can see really nicely here anterior cruciate posterior cruciate these uh, pads of cartilage the menisci and um, keeping in mind that you know their relationship here the lateral meniscus sends this connection all the way over medially and the medial meniscus is doing the same thing you see this little connection in here so they're greatly anchored into the tibia and that anchoring and cushioning is a key part of 
how the knee functions. And it's also something that usually gets injured when the knee is injured. You'll see meniscus typically involved. So at least 12 associated bursa. The capsule is reinforced by muscle tendons and uh, the joint capsule is thin and absent anteriorly, which is interesting. Anteriorly, the quadriceps tendon gives rise to lateral and medial patellar retinacula and the patellar ligament. So this absence of the joint capsule anteriorly, when you think about all of the, the motion that's happening in that area, the um, we're working with a different type of patella on femur and so anteriorly, we don't necessarily need the capsule to move that far forward. The joint capsule is actually serving those components that are within that um, are not so anterior, meaning the typically the condylar surfaces. So just kind of a view of, you know, we always uh, see the quadriceps form into this one tendon of quadriceps femoris or quadriceps tendon. Then integrating with the sesamoid bone, which part of a definition of a sesamoid bone is that it's usually embedded in tendon or ligament. Then when we go bone to bone, we have uh, the relationship where we, you know, we're heading from bone to bone instead of muscle to bone. And muscle to bone is a uh, tendon, of course. And bone to bone then is going to be a ligament, so patellar ligament, and we're tying on to this tibial tuberosity anteriorly, one of our landmarks to tell us anterior location. We'll see retinaculum, and retinaculum are these uh, connective tissue sheets that cover and reinforce areas typically in joints uh, or across muscle to help uh, tie in more strength from muscle, but usually we're seeing them as a additional strengthening connective tissue in a joint. We also have capsular and extracapsular ligaments. So are we dealing directly with the capsule or are we something uh, outside of that to help prevent hyperextension? So when you think about moving your leg, really extending it, like if you kick your lower leg forward and you're standing in an uh, anatomic position, your lower leg will only go so far anteriorly. If it goes any further than that, you start feeling this pull in the posterior compartment of your knee. And so if we're, if we're standing there and we have, you know, this set up here and quads are coming in here and we're going down, you know, we're at the end of the femur, starting at the tibia. And so then we have this force that wants to push us this way. You feel this intense pull on these items that are keeping the, the femur tied onto the tibia. And so that hyperextension is resisted by these uh, capsular and extracapsular ligaments. Intracapsular ligaments then are going to be inside the capsule. So, of course, anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, these are going to prevent anterior and posterior displacement. Uh, that's why they're injured so often. If we have some kind of an injury that goes too far anteriorly or posteriorly, we can have a tear in those cruciate ligaments. And uh, they're actually going to reside outside of the synovial cavity. Another thing we need to take a look at here. Um, we're going to see this relationship with the meniscus sending its uh, additional portion uh, heading across in a medial position, so the lateral meniscus sending medially. The medial meniscus then is going to do a similar thing, and um, it's going to send laterally. And we're also going to see this transverse ligament running across when we take a look at this 3D, 3D animation here. So when we take a look at this, we know that the, that the fibula is going to be lateral, the tibia is medial. We see this interosseous membrane, very strong sheath moving within there. So our medial and our lateral condyle on our medial and lateral meniscus. And we see those uh, meniscus pads, and then this is our 
um, coating of hyaline cartilage. We also see these uh, ligaments here. So if we're here medially, they are medial collateral ligament or tibial collateral. And if we're out here laterally, then we have our lateral collateral ligament or our fibular collateral. Um, you can also see back here this, uh, this section of posterior cruciate. And then anteriorly, we don't really get a good view of that, but we do see that transverse ligament coming across. Patella reflected. Notice it's larger medial articular facet because that condyle is so much more pronounced. And typically in our cant, when we walk, uh, we put a lot of pressure medially. So it would make sense that we need more surface area to contact that medial condyle of the femur so that we could go ahead and uh, not have dislocations or, or displacement as readily as, as we would if there was some kind of a issue with a smaller medial condyle or a smaller medial articular facet of the patella. This is also how we tell left and right if we just have a patella. So a larger medial surface indicates the, the side that that patella would be from. Just another look at that, seeing these uh, transverse ligaments, they're just sort of um, an interesting addition to the, the whole picture. Um, something that we don't see in a lot of our images, but um, just this transverse ligament that's going across and having its, its integration in here with the meniscus. Nice view of anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments and everything that we've already seen up to this point. So the next slide, um, if you're eating something or you're squeamish about cadaver images, you might want to um, readjust your food, pause the video or something. But if you're okay with that, uh, the next image is a cadaver image. And um, so what we're looking at here is we see these uh, condyloid surfaces of the femur. So we have this femur that's reflected off in space posteriorly. And with it reared back, we can really see this anterior cruciate ligament very well here. And you can see here uh, the patella is still in the, uh, the sheath that it exists in. This is actually, you can kind of see the trabeculae within there. And um, with this reflection, you can also nicely see the meniscus. These really ingenious pads that help cushion those condyles. And you can also see um, this sort of like reddish tissue on the condyles. And some of this could actually be some preliminary uh, inflammatory tissue that could eventually lead to arthritis if this person were to stay alive after this point. So something interesting there. Another cadaver image, um, really beautiful image of these menisci, uh, the medial and the lateral. Notice again, you know, we see that meniscus has been severed to just show us this transverse projection. And so we don't get that really beautiful sense of how this goes over and, you know, crosses over for its additional integration for stabilization of the knee joint. So um, anterior cruciate ligament has been cut and posterior cruciate ligament is uh, reflected here. And then you can see, you know, just like other parts of our body, there's a lot of connective tissue and this would be our patella still embedded in its connective tissue ligament and uh, tendon. And medial collateral ligament has been separated here. And on dissection, these are a little hard to see because they're so heavily integrated with the, the rest of the connective tissue in that area. But this is a good dissection, I think, to see those items. So a lot of the injuries that occur within the knee are lateral strikes, so forces coming in from a lateral direction. Naturally, as that rocks the, the femur medially and the tibia medially, we can tear that MCL or TCL anterior cruciate ligament uh, sometimes if it's severe enough, we can have problems with the posterior. And another thing that um, is referenced here that's important is the meniscus. So look at this integration between the meniscus and that collateral ligament. It's a really, you know, it's a relationship that we don't usually see because like I've been saying, this is bisected or cut across in that transverse section. 
And so this relationship between the meniscus and the TCL or the meniscus and the LCL is uh, not preserved. So this image shows why that's usually torn. When you take a look at the shoulder or the glenohumeral joint, the, the glenoid cavity with the humerus, uh, it's a ball and socket joint. The head of the humerus and glenoid fossa of the scapula are the integrating bone portions. And stability here is sacrificed for greater freedom of movement. So that tremendous range of movement that we have with the shoulder, we usually make an exchange for that in injuring it more. So the acromion of the scapula uh, coming in up here, and then that's going to have its articulation with the clavicle heading off over here. See our synovial joint cavity. Um, and, and notice again, you know, the, the synovial joint cavity has this relationship with the, the hyaline cartilage that's plugged into it and um, tendons with the bursa. So we've been looking at this pretty well. So here uh, on this shoulder, we can see what we've been looking at um, within this model approximation of the bursa, these big green chunks, then bursa around the tendons. Um, this relationship too with our coracoid process and you know crossing over with our, our ligament tie-in to the scapula. So uh, giving it sort of this cup that that it can sit within here and uh, heavily covered with this joint capsule see the spinous process of the scapula here and uh, just a really incredible joint some of the reinforcing muscle tendons are the tendon of the long head of biceps brachii which is going to travel through the intertubercular groove and secure the humerus to the glenoid cavity so we have this intertubercular groove within the humerus and that long head of biceps is going to send the tendon up to secure that within the glenoid cavity. So we have four rotator cuff tendons that encircle the shul shoulder joint and these are the muscle names that relate to them. Subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. And one of the acronyms that I use to remember this is the SITS acronym. So just reordering these a little bit, uh, sits is going to be your rotator cuff. And so you could take any of the S's, infraspinatus, teres minor, and uh, the other S, and that's your sits. So just kind of a mnemonic to help remember the rotator cuff uh, names. All right, so we'll take a look at some of the rotator cuff muscles here. We'll zoom in on this portion. And so what we see are that we have these four muscles that tie on to the humerus across the glenohumeral joint. And we're, of course, in relation with the humerus and the scapula. And those four muscles are going to cross over that joint and form the rotator cuff. So in this animation, then, um, we see the four rotator cuff muscles coming across and they're formation as they tie into the head of the humerus is what we would consider the actual rotator cuff. So if someone tears their rotator cuff, they may have torn this connection to the bone. A lot of times too, they can have an injury directly to one of the muscles that forms the rotator cuff. The elbow joint uh, that we've kind of taken a look at already, the radius and ulna articulate with the humerus. It's a hinge joint formed mainly by the trochlear notch of the ulna and trochlea of humerus, and this is for flexion and st extension only. Here we're going to take a look at the elbow, this joint that is formed by uh, and crossed by the muscles of biceps brachii and brachialis. And with the flexion of biceps brachii and brachialis, we have this uh, flexion of the arm. We also have brachioradialis in the mix. And so then that would be flexion. For extension, our major extensors are triceps brachii. And that joint then is a hinge joint that also has a pivot joint within it to give us pronation. So we can see really similar to the shoulder joint, we have this uh, relationship here where we have uh, humerus interacting with ulna. And that's going to give us the hinge joint and our classic bursa synovial joint type of relationship in this uh, joint. And so we um, 
just see another classic example of that. The hip or the coxal joint is a ball and socket joint. The head of the femur articulates with the acetabulum. There's a good range of motion, but it's limited by the deep socket of the acetabulum. And the acetabulum labrum enhances the depth of socket, which is a, a ring of um, cartilage that's very similar to the meniscus that we see in the knee. So here, just kind of zooming in on that, um, we can see the, the natural movement of the hip joint. So here's extension, uh, previously was flexion. And uh, within that then, it's, it's just pretty classic movements. We have AB, abduction, and then adduction. So when we take a look at the, the movement for abduction, so we're moving the leg away from the body. So this is AB, abduction. This then is adduction, we're adding the leg in. We have a lateral rotation and we have a little bit of medial rotation, but, but not a whole lot. And those are the major movements that happen across this ball and socket joint. Very similar situation that we've seen with our other synovial joints and um, classic ball and socket with the relationship between the head of the femur and the acetabulum. The temporal mandibular joint or TMJ it's where the mandibular condyle articulates with the temporal bone. There are two types of movement uh, within this, and uh, what we're interested in is a hinge movement and a gliding movement. So this lateral excursion is kind of what you see when uh, people grind their teeth, or like if you think of a cow chewing its cud, then that's the grinding of teeth that we're thinking about. So usually the pterygoid muscles that are tied into that uh, pterygoid portion of sphenoid. Most easily dislocated joint in the body, a lot of times because of fights or just the exposure of the jaw projecting so anteriorly. And um, a very amazing joint though, and amazing that it lasts as long and as well as it does. A lot of times if people have problem though, problems with the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa, you see the proximity to the ear. You can have some issues within that where when people have TMJ, they might have ringing in the ears or they might have other issues that cause problems. Uh, common joint injuries that we take a look at are sprains and cartilage tears. So in sprains, we're actually stretching or tearing a ligament. So it has to be bone to bone. Partial tears will slowly repair themselves and complete ruptures might require prompt surgical repair with uh, some kind of cadaver tissue or the patient's own tissue. Cartilage tears, then, are usually due to compression and shear stress, and fragments may cause joint to lock or bind. So um, that we're talking about when a chunk of cartilage tears off, that fragment may cause the joint to lock or bind. So this is where you see people that will have to go in, and, you know, maybe we have um, some kind of a situation where you know, if we're, if we're taking a look at the tibia, we're, say, at the top of the tibia, and classically there's, there's this torn piece of meniscus that then when the, the femur is interacting with this, um, there can be pain in this area. So an orthoscopic approach comes in, clips off this little chunk of meniscus, and then that's usually repaired. So... Um, arthroscopic surgery. A torn meniscus, so you're seeing this would be the smooth meniscus over here, and then we start to tear, and it almost looks like a rupture. So um, what they're going to do is go in and cut off this portion of meniscus so that there's no more pain or minimized pain there on the other portion of the bone. Some other common joint injuries, uh, dislocations or luxations, occur when bones are forced out of alignment usually accompanied by sprains, inflammation, and joint immobilization might cause the joint to stop moving if there's enough inflammation or enough dislocation, usually caused by serious falls or playing sports. Uh, a subluxation is a partial dislocation of a joint, so not considered an entire dislocation, but maybe just partially. Some key inflammatory and degenerative conditions, bursitis. We've looked at the bursa, 
So an itis then is going to be an inflammation. And so an inflammation of the bursa, usually caused by a blow or friction, um, usually treated with rest and ice and if severe anti-inflammatory drugs. Tendonitis, uh, inflammation of tendon sheaths, which tendon sheaths are technically bursa, typically caused by overuse and symptoms and treatment are similar to bursitis because it really is bursitis. And, um, you know, so immobilization, ice, anti-inflammatory drugs. So within arthritis, we have an arthro, a joint, and an itis, a swelling. So there are over a hundred different types of inflammatory or degenerative diseases that damage joints. Most widespread crippling disease in the U.S., pain, uh, stiffness, swelling of joint, uh, some of the acute forms can be caused by bacteria and treated with antibiotics. Some of the chronic forms, we're starting to take a look at um, if it's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gouty arthritis. And in some of these, do we have an autoimmune issue that is actually causing this form of arthritis? So osteoarthritis, or OA, is a common irreversible degenerative wear and tear type of arthritis. It comes from wear and tear. 85% of all Americans develop osteoarthritis and more women than men. This has to do with the relationship with the progressive loss of the estrogens in women that help regulate osteoclast activity. There's more of that um, estrogen issue happening within women than men probably related to the normal aging process, but also possibly uh, some issues with the immune system. More cartilage is destroyed than replaced within this condition in uh, badly aligned or overworked joints. This exposed bone then is going to thicken and large form bone spurs and restrict movement. The treatment is usually moderate activity, mild pain relievers, capsaicin creams, which are heating creams, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, and we've seen glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate within our discussion of the matrix. Rheumatoid arthritis, a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease of unknown cause, usually arises between the age of 40 and 50, but may occur at any age, and affects three times as many women as men. One of the things that they're looking at for this particular disease is, is it related to a form of uh, psoriasis? So the same type of or similar type of um, issue but moving into the joints rather than on the skin. Signs and symptoms include joint pain and swelling, usually bilaterally, uh, anemia, osteoporosis, muscle weakness, and can have some cardiovascular problems. RA begins with synovitis of the affected joint, so those syn the synovial portion of the joint is going to swell. Inflammatory blood cells migrate to the joint and release inflammatory chemicals. The inflamed synovial membrane thickens into a panis, kind of a callus, and the panis erodes cartilage, scar tissue forms, and then the articulating bone ends connect. And that's where we have the severe pain too, and uh, this is referred to as ankylosis. So pretty difficult, gnarly disease. Treatment for this, uh, there's conservative therapy which would be aspirin, long-term use of antibiotics, and physical activity, progressive treatment of anti-inflammatory drugs or immunosuppressants, and uh, new biological response modifier drugs that can neutralize inflammatory chemicals. Gouty arthritis, uh, usually referred to as the disease of the rich, uh, because it's a rich diet that can play into it, excessive protein, it causes the uh, deposition of uric acid crystals in the joints and soft tissues, followed by inflammation. More common in men, uh, typ typically affects the joint at the base of the great toe. And if it's untreated, the bone ends fuse and immobilize the joint. So these, these uric acid crystals can cause a fusion of the joint. The treatment can be drugs, plenty of water to flush this uric acid and the avoidance of alcohol. Lyme disease usually caused, uh, tr the transmission vector is usually a tick caused by bacteria uh, that that tick transmits. The symptoms are a skin rash, flu-like symptoms, and foggy thinking. And that's usually somewhat initially, but then years later, this can lead to joint pain and arthritis. The treatment for it is antibiotics, but 
if it's not caught early enough, those antibiotics typically won't do anything against it. So it's kind of a, you get bit by a tick, watch for the skin rash, um, and then think about getting antibiotics. Because if you wait, it lies dormant and will come up later in life. Developmental aspects of joints. Uh, so again, developmental, we're, we're thinking about um, our, our position in the womb. So by embryonic week eight, synovial joints resemble adult joints. So that's pretty amazing. After uh, conception by week eight, those synovial joints resemble adult joints. So a joint size, shape, and flexibility are going to be modified by use. And advancing years take their toll on joints. Ligaments and tendons shorten and weaken. Intervertebral discs become more likely to herniate. Which, by the way, it's kind of interesting that every day when we wake up, our intervertebral discs are plumped up with uh, more fluid. And usually by the end of the day, we're uh, going to be one centimeter shorter than when we started the day just because of gravitational pull and compression of these intervertebral discs. Uh, most people in their 70s have some form of osteoarthritis and exercise that can coax the joints through their full range of motion is key to postponing more joint problems.